Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Friday workshop for Bloodhound. I don't see any questions coming in, so I'm going to start off discussing the next solver on the list. So last week, I covered the threshold solver. And so uh, this week, I will talk about the regression channel position solver. So um, this solver is uh, specific to the regression channel just because of the uniqueness of it. Um, so let me kind of get things ready here. And uh, just a reminder for all you new guys, this is a, these workshops are an open question and answer session. So I do rely on your guys' questions to kind of uh, fill these workshops up. So, um, all right. Uh, okay, so let me get my chart ready here. Um, So Ninja's regression channel, let me, I'll put that on here first. Okay, so there's Ninja's regression channel. And now I'm going to put a, a unique regression channel on here. There we go. So the ANA regression channel. So all these ANA indicators are um, freely available up on Big Mike's um, and I'm sure that some or most of them are up on Ninja's download site as well, I believe. Um, anyways, and these, so these ANA indicators are written by um, a programmer, calls himself Harry. Um, and Harry and another partner of his have actually opened up a website now. And so you'll be able to get all of their free indicators so these are all the free indicators off directly off of their website. So it's going to be a much easier place to get them from. Um, but also, since they're kind of since now that they're officially forming a business, um, they're calling they're going to call themselves Lizard Trader, and uh, they uh, are in the process of partnering with us. So all these ANA indicators are going to be uh, are from Lizard Trader, and they are partnering with us. Um, so um, I guess just just to disclose that there, um, not that it really means anything, but these are all these are all these ANA indicators are, are, are really good in good free indicators here. So if you have a Big Mike's uh, 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 membership, um, I would recommend that you uh, download these uh, from them. So just to recap, right? I have. Ninja Traders regression channel and the Anna regression channel. I'll show you the difference between the two. And oh, let me make the Ninja one a little thicker. Okay, I'll make the Ninja one red. All right, so the Ninja one, you only see it um, on the right-hand side of the chart in, in real time. So if I scroll back, right, you can see Ninja's regression channel doesn't self-adjust going backwards, right? It just disappears. So you can't see what's happening historically. But you can see the blue one, regression channel, is updating itself as I scroll back on the chart, right, which is a really cool feature. So... The blue regression channel, that is the ANA regression channel from Lizard Trader. So, um, so if you want to implement the regression channel into your system, I highly recommend that you go get the ANA regression channel. So that way you can do some, you know, historical testing with this indicator, right? So you can see I can scroll back and do some historical testing, but the Ninja Trader regression channel has completely disappeared, though. So, all right, so I'm going to take the Ninja one off of my chart here. All right, and all right. So the regression channel solver um, uses 
obviously uses this indicator here. So I'll, I'll explain how it, how it works here. So let's get Bloodhound open. All right, so let me back up here. So I already have Bloodhound on my chart. So you can see it, it has the green and the red bars. So when you see it like this, that means that nothing has been done. No work has been done yet inside of Bloodhound. So um, and Bloodhound is going to put uh, your button up here on the top of the chart. So right now the Bloodhound uh, is empty. So it has an empty template. So I'll click on that and it opens up Bloodhound interface. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to name my file here. I'm going to name my Bloodhound system. So I'm just click the change button and I name all of these Bloodhound workshop templates here with the date. So I'll just put today's date on there. All right, so we have a named system here. And let me put the solver on here. So the regression channel position on there. All right, so what this solver is doing is it's actually looking, it's looking at where price is relative to the channel here. So let's see, let me back up. And oh actually first first thing I need to do is make sure that my the indicator settings so you see I have the channel parameters so I have a period of 50 and a width of four. So I need to make sure that my indicator on the chart matches what the settings are in Bloodhound. All right, so right now this output doesn't make sense and that's because the, the uh, probably my period setting and my width setting are probably different from the indicator. So let's see, the indicator is using a period of 50, but the width is a little smaller. So let me change the width to four here. And while I'm at it, I'm going to make these lines a little thicker. That way you guys can see them better. And uh, thicken up the middle one as well. All right, there we go. All right, so you can see that the, the solver has a bunch of different zones here and uh, for the output, right? So the output is affected by where price is in relationship to each of these zones. So the key thing about, uh, the key thing to know, you know, on how to use this solver is to learn where these zones are, what these various zones mean and uh, where they are. So um, let me stretch my chart out here to kind of help. So, um, all right, so I'm going to back up on my chart here a little bit. All right. So the default setting for this solver, the way the way the way that the output is set up for each of these zones. So the default setting is that zone F and E are going to give us a signal when price is within zone E and F. So just just take a quick look. So we can see that price has come down here close to the bottom channel and it triggered off a, uh, a long signal there. If I back up a little more, once again there's a long signal. I have to keep backing up. Now when price approaches the upper channel, you can see it's giving us uh, a short signal there. Right. So that's um, right. So this it's kind of how the solver is working in its default mode. So now I'm going to pull up the documentation on this, and the documentation has graphic uh, images that explain where the various zones are. So um, right. So to do that, if you want to pull up the documentation you know for any of these solvers here so you can learn what they're doing 
the easiest thing to do is just go to help we'll click on documentation right. that'll open up our web browser wait for that to load all right so we're back to our bloodhound documentation page now um, so we're going to take a look on this menu on the right hand side and under bloodhound reference we see we have the uh, confident solvers so let's go down this list of solvers here and here is our regression channel position so I can just click on that and that'll bring up our documentation page so alright so if we scroll down so here's a written explanation of each of the zones and if we keep scrolling down um, right keep scrolling down so under the examples down here here is a couple of graphic images that help explain where the various zones are here so um, All right, so this image, this image shows the zones for the long output, right? So, um, so for the long output, right, which is the green signals, zone A is on top, zone F is on the bottom. So if you look at these zone areas, right, you can see that the zones um, inside the channel, the channel inside the channel, the channel is broken up into four zones each right so the so the channel has been broken up into quarters so the top half of the regression channel is going to be zone B and C the bottom half of the channel right so from the midline to the lower channel is going to be zone D and E right so um, now zone A is basically everything above the upper channel you know any you know area above the upper channel and of course and then zone F is going to be any area below the lower channel right so zone so long output zone A is above zone F is below now if I look at this other one Order. this oh. is for the short outputs and you'll see that the zones are reversed. So zone A is at the lower channel. Zone F is at the upper channel. They're reversed. So, um, so keeping that in mind, let me go back to the. Uh, let me go back to the solver settings here. Right. So we have zone E and F set to 1. So we're going to get an output with E and F. And uh, just to make this easier to visualize, I'm going to set all these others to 0. Okay, so zone E and F. So let's take a look at that image again. So for the short output, zone E and F is going to be the upper part of the channel. Right, so when price gets within zone E, um, or price gets um, within zone F, we're going to get an output here. So, um, as you can see, this graphic image, the outputs are actually different. The outputs being used on this uh, graphical image is zone B and A, B and A. So this image actually that the outputs were changed. So um, so actually let me go ahead and uh, I'll match the graphics. That way it's uh, that way the two line up. So I'm going to set E to zero. I'm going to set zone F to zero, and we're set zone A and zone one. I'm sorry, zone A and zone B to one. All right. So now. This solver is set up the same way as the graphical image here. Right. So when price comes down into zone B, 
or zone A, we're going to get a short output. And then if we take a look at the other image here for the long output, so for the long output, when price um, comes within zone B or A, we're going to get a long output. All right. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that when you're looking back on your chart historically, um, the channel always changes on on every bar back. So you can't look at like this this price area where price you know made this nice move up here. You can't look at that even though it looks like it's in zone B. That's not giving you the correct information. So you can't look at this his area historically on your chart to read Bloodhound's output, right? And so this actually this area down here where my mouse is, you can see that price is actually inside of zone C, but we're still getting a long output. So that kind of demonstrates that you can't look at this output historically. You have to, you can only look at price and where price is within the zones on the rightmost bar. So it has to be the bar on the right edge of your chart is the only way to properly see where price is within within the uh, regression channel. So, and to, to kind of demonstrate that, um, let's see. Yeah, let me um, let me put a little circle here, right? So this circle here, um, <clears throat> right? It, it's clearly as we look back, this little circle is not down in zone B or A. It's not down there. But if I scroll backwards on my chart, now you see how the, the channel, the lower channel is getting closer and closer. So now <clears throat> uh, price is uh, closer to that lower channel. And so now it, we can visually see that actually the closing price did come, it just barely dipped, I'd say it just barely dipped down into zone B here, right? So as I scroll forward, the channel flattens out and you can, we can see price moves really far away from that lower channel. So you can only, um, when you're looking at where price is in comparison to the channel, you can only do it one bar at a time. As you can see, every bar, the channel angle is changing, right? So, um, all right, so let's kind of take a look at some examples here. Here, here we go. Let's take a look at this. So I'm going to stretch this out even a little more. All right, so we're looking at the, the bar on the right side of the chart. So um, let me put a little diamond here. Right, so price is not didn't quite make it into the upper quarter of our channel. Didn't quite make it up here into zone B. If I step forward one more bar, there we go. Now we can see that price is definitely in the upper half of the upper part of the channel here. Right, so that so now we can see the closing price is in is within zone B. So and once again, definitely up here within zone B. And here's here we go. Here's an example of where the closing price is actually in zone A, right? It's above the channel in zone A. And uh, still, now now the price is in zone B. And now the price is in zone A. Look at that. So on a steep up move of price, you know, price is going to shoot up here into zone A above the upper channel. So, and now price, the closing price has moved down into uh, zone B down here. So therefore there's no, no output, no long output anymore. Right, so let's take a look. Take a look at the solver settings again. 
Um, so zone C, so right now, I'm sorry, price is here in zone C. And so there's no output. The output is set to zero, right? So if I really wanted to find extreme moves in price, I could turn off zone B and only look for zone A. And so now as I go back to my chart, if I step back, I can see these you know fast moves in price where price actually breaks above the upper channel like that. So let's kind of take a look. I squish the chart up here and um, here we go. So let's scroll way back here. All right. So we have a nice little uh, downtrend going on here and then um, price bake breaks above the upper channel into zone A and uh, looks like that kind of gave us a little hint that maybe uh, uh, a slowdown in this downtrend is happening or a possible reversal um, to an uptrend. We really, you know, obviously we really won't know if this is a reversal or maybe just consolidation uh, happening here until price uh, begins to really move up here. So we can see that, um, yeah, price is just breaking out of the upper channel, kind of letting us know that maybe a new uptrend is going to start here. So, you know, at the very least, if you have a trading system that, you know, identifies this downtrend, we can see that using this regression channel solver helps us identify, you know, that, hey, this downtrend is could be weakening here. So we might want to get out of our position. All right, so at the very least, you can use this as a warning to close out, you know, any remaining short positions. All right. Or you could possibly use this in combination with other, uh, you know, with other components of your trading system to help help you identify an early uptrend, you know, uh, the start of an early uptrend, like so. Right. So with so zone A and kind of using zone A and zone B, you can see that zone A and zone B is kind of like identifying uh, it's it's identifying with the trend so as I step forward on my chart here right um, actually I'll let me just keep this simple I'll just keep it to zone a so we can see that zone a basically is kind of identifying where price is moving um, or I should say the output of the solver is in the trend direction of price so as price is moving up right the output is a long output right so it's in the same direction as the trend right so since price is moving up the output is long matching that trend direction and of course uh, the same for shorts let's see if there's any where's some shorts there we go So I'll scroll back a little further. Here we go. So scrolling back here, let's step forward. And so now that price is moving down, right? Zone A is giving us a short output when price is moving down. So that short matches the 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 uh, the downtrend that uh, is happening here, like so, right? So if you want to use the regression channel to identify counter trend movements, then we want to use zone F. So zone F is going to identify counter trend movements. So let's take a look at this now. I'll go back to the beginning of the chart. Right, so we can see price makes a nice big move up. And we're getting these counter trend short uh, signals here. Um, and price does eventually kind of 
pull back here. Uh, same here, counter trend output, and we don't really get a, you know, uh, yeah, we don't, I, I don't know, it's kind of subjective, but uh, we don't really get a pullback. Uh, we do get this one little pullback, but really what we ended up with is consolidation there. Um, right, so once again, price moves up, we get this counter trend identification by using zone F. Um, then we get some consolidation um, and uh, right once again same here counter trend against the up move and then price consolidates and pulls back a little bit All right so the easiest thing to remember is that zone A is with the trend zone F is against the trend or counter trend right um, if you want to try and uh, identify if price is consolidating uh, let's take a look at zone C and D right so um, so taking a look at the graphics right zone zone C and D are right up against the midline right so the midline is the solid line And for the short outputs, once again, C and D are still right up against this, this midline here. So, um, <clears throat> let's take a look here. Hmm. Yeah, not quite what I expected. So we definitely have a nice little up move, but we're we're getting a lot of um, outputs here. So you know, C and D eh, doesn't look like it's quite so good at cons at uh, finding consolidation here. It you know I'd say what it's telling us is that uh, this is an uptrend, but price is kind of moving up moderately in this uptrend. Um, so I guess you could do two things. You could look at the angle of, you know, the slope of the channel and, um, you know, identify if price is moving up, um, moderately by using zone, uh, C and D. And then if we scroll back here, let's see, uh, Huh. Yeah, well, the way the regression channel is working out here, it's still on a nice little upslope. Um, but we definitely have some consolidation in price here. So, um, let's see. I don't know, maybe the period on my channel is a little too, too long to try and find consolidation. Let's see. Yeah, maybe if I shorten this up to 30. So, there we go. Now our channel kind of flattens out here, so we could, you know, I we could use like a slope solver and look at the slope of our channel, see if it's kind of flat um, or not, and if price is still within zone C and D, then that's kind of a hint that we're, uh, price is kind of consolidating or flat, right? Um, however, at the same time, I do need to change the period in my solver here. So there we go. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so using zone, I'd say using zone C and D, you definitely need to look at kind of the, the slope of either the channel itself or maybe you've got a favorite moving average that you like to look at. Um, and we can see if, if price is actually moving up moderately or if price is kind of kind of flat there so um, 
So, all right, let me take this a, a step further here. So I'm gonna move over to the logic board and type a name for this logic template. All right, so I'm gonna take that existing node that I built on the solver tab. I'll put it on here like so. All right, so now let's take a look at the slope of the regression channel. So where is that slope solver? There we go. Grab that slope solver. All right, so, so we'll take a look at the slope of the regression channel with the 30 period. So let's connect that up. And let's see. First thing is I'll change my indicator over to the regression channel. So in this case, um, I'm just going to use, yeah, well, yeah, let me stick with the Anna one. I'll stick with the same regression channel. So in theory, if we're looking at the slope, um, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. The, um, the regression channel solver itself is using NinjaTrader's regression channel indicator right to do its calculations so I am actually going to use ninja's regression channel indicator to find the slope here so I need to change this to a, a 30 period and change the width to 4 and I want to look at the slope of the middle right the middle plot there Look at it like that. So remember the the Anna regression channel. I just have that on my chart, so that way I can scroll backwards and and uh, you know see see where the channel angle is, you know, and the position of the regression channel uh, historically. So, um, all right. So I'm going to set this slope solver up. To identify when the regression channel is flat or uh, flattish, yeah. So, uh, so let's put that in the name here. So we're going to look to see when it's flat. And the next thing I need to do is put some kind of a minimum slope in here. So let's see. Um, I guess I'm gonna start off by probably using something like uh, 0.5 ticks of slope so I'm going to set both the max and the minimum slope to 0.5 ticks and what I'm looking for set that to zero is I want to use this bottom one here so um, I'm going to click off and click back on here so you can see the uh, the descriptions here. If we take a look th at this description, it says less than 0 0.5 ticks, right? So I'm going to get an output when the slope is less than 0.5 ticks of slope here. So. Um, Let's take a look at the chart. Hmm. I think I might have a setting wrong. So, because our channel is sloping down, it looks like. Yeah, our channel's sloping down. Let me see. So that is 30 and 4. So let me check this slope solver again thirty and four 
Hmm. So I'm using the output in direction. So if if we have a long output, I guess what, what I'm expecting to see is the re regression channel sloping up a little bit. And here, let me, let me take these moving averages off. And hmm. Yeah, so now this, the regression channel is definitely sloping down. And now that slope solver is giving me a short output, identifying a little downslope here. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm actually going to put Ninja's regression channel on here help me figure this out so I'm going to turn the um, upper and lower channels off to make those invisible and let's see I'm going to make the middle line white and let's see So let me show you what I'm doing here. So what I did is I clicked on the Ninja Traders regression channel, which is the dashed white line. And you see how the highlighted uh, white dots come up? So that is showing me where the middle line, where the midpoint line has been on a historical basis. Right, so we can see it's been um, uh, right, it's been moving in this, like this. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Actually, I think a better indicator is going to be, I think, the linear regression. Yeah, so let me get a couple of indicators on here. So we have the linear regression, and um, I believe, I'm pretty certain that the linear regression is the formula that's used for the regression channel. So uh, the regression channel is a channel that's placed on the linear regression formula. So I'm going to put the linear the original linear regression formula, which actually makes the midpoint, the middle line of the ch of the channel, and then uh, Ninja Trader has another um, indicator here for the that shows the linear regression slope. So I'm also going to put that on here as well. All right, yeah. So this this helps identify it. Um, I'm gonna take the Linreg slope off, and we'll just keep the linear regression indicator on here. So remember, I set I slip the slope solver up to identify basically flat areas. Um, all right, so I have this less than 0.5 ticks of slope. So right, so the slope solver is going to tell us when, when the indicator, when the slope of the indicator is basically flat. Um, and I should also turn this one on here. So if the slope is completely flat, um, I can identify that too. So as we look at this, right? So when we can see when the linear regression goes flat, 
And remember, the linear regression is what calculates this regression channel. Um, so, uh, yeah, there we go. So now, um, so you can see that the slope in the mid, middle line, it is sloping up a little bit. So we can see the orange line shows that the middle line actually was sloping up a little bit. And so we got a long output on this kind of flat upslope up of the middle line. And right here, yeah, hmm. So, so there's, okay, so, so now I've identified why this isn't working as I expected. Um, so even though the channel's sloping up uh, the midline, the points for the midline have actually been moving down. So, um, hmm. So I can't actually, yeah, I can't actually use Order the linear regression indicator. Let's see. So I need to see if there actually is an indicator that will give us the slope of the actual channel. So the channel takes the linear regression, um, and modifies it a little bit. Hmm. I'm going to put the Linreg slope back on here again. Looks like it doesn't look like there is a an indicator that actually will give us a feedback on the slope of the channel. So I may not be able to do what I was hoping to do. Let's see. Hmm. So I'm just looking through the indicators to see if there's uh, some indicator that'll help that actually calculates the slope of the channel. Actually, yeah, maybe there's one possibility. It's I'm a, I am so I'm a, going back to the slope solver, and I'm actually going to take a look at the Anna. Uh, regression slope and maybe that has a hidden data series no hmm it doesn't darn take a look at that linear regression intercept so as this is demonstrating you know as you're kind of coming up with your own ideas it definitely takes some uh, experimenting sometimes to kind of to kind of discover what you're hoping to find No, it doesn't. The yes, intercept isn't matching the slope of the channel either. Yeah, so the intercept, the intercept is sloping down here, but I can see the channel still sloping up. So that's not what I wanted. Um, hmm.
Well, let me ask you guys, does anybody know the formula out there for the regression channel? Because maybe there's a moving average that um, mimics what the regression channel is. Or maybe the regression channel is using some kind of moving average uh, to calculate its slope. So I thought it was using the linear regression, but I, like I said, I could be wrong. You know, so the regression channel is definitely using um, some moving average formula, right, to calculate its uh, slope. So it's just a matter of finding what that moving average is um, let's see how about I'll just take a guess here let's put in an SMA back on here and uh, we'll put a 30 period and I'll put an EMA on here with a 30 period see if one of those comes comes close so um, yeah it's not the EMA so the EMA is the red line and that's sloping down slightly when the channel is still sloping up pretty pretty good. So I'm going to take the EMA off and let's see. I don't think it's the SMA either because the channel's flattening out here, but the SMA is still sloping up pretty darn good. I'll try a couple more moving averages. So I'll try the HMA and the TMA. And let's make sure I set those to a 30 period. Not the HMA. Let's see if it's the TMA. No. Yeah, it looks like the TMA is sloping down as well. Hmm. Oh. Maybe it's our ADX VMA. Let's take a look at that. One more shot at this. the ADX VMA either. Well, all right. Well, sorry guys. Unfortunately, you know, I was trying to, you know, back to the original, uh, uh, back to the original condition here. I was, you know, trying to f combine the slope of the channel with the right regression channel position solver uh, to see if we could identify when the channel was flat and then also identify when price is kind of near the midline of that channel to try and see if we can kind of detect consolidation of price you know when price is choppy and whatnot um, so 
Uh, let's see, Dan is asking, what about the linear regression slope indicator? So, no, Dan, sorry, Dan, that's one of the first indicators I tried out uh, earlier on. So, unfortunately, that was not it. Uh, thanks for the suggestion, though. Um, yeah, so, darn. Well, you know, if one of you guys ever discover that, you know, feel free to send me an email and uh, we can, uh, I can follow up on this on next week. So, so I guess for now, uh, I'll just take that slope solver away. Unfortunately, we'll just leave that guy connected up like that. So, so let's see. Let to uh, let me leave this. Um, uh, let me leave this demonstration with two different um, regression channel settings here. So let me shorten the name here. So we got uh, regression channel. Um, so with uh, set this one up for the trend. So remember, A and B kind of identifies, uh, or with, with zone A and B, the output um, is going to be in line with the trend of the current price move, right? As that kind of shows. And then what I'll do is I'm going to, let's see, let me delete that slope solver there. So I'm going to take the uh, regression channel position, make a copy of it, and um, and um, we'll set this one up as a counter trend. So I'll turn zone A and B off and set zone E and F on like so. All right, let's put that new solver on the board here. All right, so as we look at the chart, if I plug the other one in, we can see it basically just kind of reverses the output there. Like so. All right, if there's any questions on this, guys, please feel free to ask away. You know, um, I don't see any other questions here, guys. So I will answer Gary's question. So I'm going to cover the slope solver again. Uh, all right, so let's name this logic template here. edit the name of that previous logic template. So let's go to the slope solver. Okay, so I'm going to set some indicators up on my chart. So I'll just put the SMA up on my chart. We'll start with something simple here. So I have the SMA 14 period on my chart. So let me add a new slope solver. We'll connect that up. So you can see that the slope solver defaults to the SMA 14, right? So actually all of these indicator solvers they all default to the SMA 14 as their kind of default Boy, indicator in there. So we have the SMA 14 already set up in the solver, and we have the SMA 14 on the chart. And so as you can see, when the sol when the SMA is sloping up, the solver is going to give us a long output, and when the SMA slopes down, it's going to give us a short output. So, right, so the 
the default output is in the direction of the slope. All right, so down here we have in direction. Right, so the output in direction is is turned on by default. All right now, if I want, I can reverse this output. So if for some reason you're using the slope of an indicator and you want to get a, a counter trend output, I can turn the in direction off and I can use the against direction here. So I can set that to one. And so now we can see that the output is reversed. So now when the slope is, when the slope of the SMA is up, we're getting a short output here. So that just reverses it. So. All right, let's kind of um, <clears throat> get into some using uh, the max and minimum slope here. So let's say I want to cut out, um, let's turn this on here. So let's say I want to cut out when, when the slope is flat um, or flat-ish. So let's take a look here. So um, we can actually see here, see this one bar where, where it's black? There's no a background painting here, no racing stripe. And that's because the SMA is actually perfectly flat. And I mean perfectly flat, out, out to several decimal points, it's flat. Um, so that means there's absolutely no slope on it. So if there's any just the slightest hint of a slope on our indicator, so like for example, right here, right, that looks very flat, but it's not perfectly flat. And so the solver tells us that it's slightly sloping up, just a little, just by a fraction, but it's enough that it's actually sloping up. You know, whereas this over here is perfectly flat. So, um, so let's say we want to identify, let's see if I can find a nice long area where our moving average kind of flattens out. Here we go. So let's say right, right there, right? The slope of our indicator kind of flattens out right there. So we want to remove that um, from the slope solver's output, right? So we want to kind of ignore that area there. So let's try, um, I'm just going to guesstimate um, some maximum and minimum slopes here to use. So I'm going to start to start off with 0.5. So the kind of the, the value here to start off with depends on two factors. It, it depends on the instrument itself, so it depends on how small the tick size is of the instrument, right? And, and it also depends on how volatile that instrument is. So the volatility and the tick size influences, will influence, you know, this value here. And also the indicator itself. Right, some indicators like the MACD, uh, in some cases the MACD moves a lot faster than an SMA does. So, um, right, so you, when you're trying to find out, you know, what value to start off with on these slopes, um, you really just kind of have to start off with a guess. Um, so, I I suggest that if your indicator is up on the price panel that you probably start off somewhere around 0.5 um, you know just to kind of as a starting point if you're using an indicator on the sub panel like down here um, that really depends on the indicator um, so like for example the MACD so I can see the MACD is actually moving in 0.01 you know, like the, the movements here are really small, right? We're down around 0 0.01, 0 0.015, but the stochastic, its values are ranging from zero to 100, right? So the, 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 uh, the values on the stochastic are much higher than the values on the MACD. 
So, um, um, so with the stochastic, you know, I would probably start off with somewhere around like one or two or three um, as you know as your slope values. Whereas the MACD, um, gosh, the MACD, I might actually probably start off at something like 0 0.05 because the MACD here, I can see it's scaling, starts off with 0, 0.0 something, right? We have 0 0.01 to 0 0.02, so the MACD is moving really slowly. Um, so, since I'm using starting off with an SMA here, I'm gonna start off with 0.5, because since the SMA is up here on the price panel, and as we take a look at this, um, that was actually a pretty good guess. So I can see that this whole area now is um, blank, no output. Right, and so if we take a look over here, right, no, no output until we can see the slope of our moving average slopes up pretty good. Pretty good right there. So let me take a moment to name this solver here. So this is our SMA 14 there. So um, let's see. So 0.5 might be, you know, might look uh, like we're cutting out too much, right? Because we did kind of cut out this one bar here. So I might want to lower it a little bit. Let's try. 0.4, like so. There we go. So using 0.4, now this this one bar here is now right considered a downslope, and so our flat areas got a little bit smaller now, a little bit less of these flat areas. But uh, yeah, but we can see that we cut out those flat areas like that. So. Um, And uh, let's see. Um, so let me fine tune this name here. So all right. So this is has no flat areas in it on our SMA 14. So let me grab another slope solver. Connect that in there, and so it's once again. Let's go uh, an SMA 14, and now let's say we want to find the flat areas. <clears throat> so if we want to find a flat area on uh, some indicator, so let's see. I'll put, I'll set up the same here. So point. One four ticks a slope. This time, I'm going to turn these upper outputs off and just use the lower one here. So, all right. Now the see the description here says less than zero ticks. All right, that's the one I turned on. So for some of you, we don't know why, but for some reason, sometimes this on some computers this description doesn't update automatically and on most machines it does seem to update automatically but if yours is not updating like this so if you change your minimum slopes your maximum slopes and this description doesn't update all you gotta do is just click off click back on and that forces um, the menu to update so we can see now it reads less than 0 0.04 ticks a slope Right, so I want to find out when when the slope is less than 0 0.04 ticks. So now, if we look at this, kind of shrink this up. Now we're getting an output when the slope is really flat, right? And so the output is in the direction of the slope, but the slope is really flat now. So. Um, so if you're right, if you want to identify a flat slope, you may not be interested in just 
isolating the output in the direction of the slope. So for example, you might want to get an output that just identifies a long and a short situation here, right? So the reason being is that if your indicator is flat or flat-ish, you know, kind of in the flat range of things, something when something's flat, that really is not identifying a direction, a, a trade direction, right? So if you're trying to identify kind of when your indicator is in a non-directional state, non-directional or flat, then typically you'll want your solver to give you a long and a short output, like so. So for an example, um, you might use this as a exit logic. So you can say, you know, when my indicator goes flat, I want to exit my position. I want Raven to exit my position. You know, my indicator went flat, so I want Raven to go flat and close out my position. And so if you want to do that, you want to get a long and a short output to close out both a long and or a short position. You know, so you when you're if you use this as an exit logic, you won't know whether Raven is in a long trade or if Raven's in a short trade. So since you won't know what side of the trade Raven's in, you're going to want a long and a short output to make sure that it, Raven flattens any position that you may have open. So, um, uh, so uh, using the against direction and in direction is how we get this right dual output here, how we get this long and short output like so. so um, and um, yeah, let's just kind of, I'll just use the slope solver and give some examples on some other indicators here. So I'm going to set this next one up to the stochastic since I have that on my chart already. So I believe I have a stochastic uh, 7 and 14 on the chart. Let's see. Yeah, 7, 14, 3 standard stochastic settings. So let me change my SMA indicator over to the stochastics. All right, there's our stochastics. So, all right, and we'll take a look at the D plot, the percent D, which is the green line here. All right, so I'm using 7, 14, and 3 as my period settings. Click OK. And as you guys might have guessed, when the stochastic is sloping up, we get a long output, and when it slopes down, we get a short output, like so. All right, and just to kind of give one more similar example here, I'll do one with the MACD here. Um, let's see, the MACD doing 12 and 26 yeah. and um, let's see yeah we'll just take a look at the MACD line because that's that's the one that I have turned on right now it's just the MACD line so my settings 12 26 and 9 those are good and uh, there we go. Pretty simple stuff. Um, let's kind of play around with the slope settings for the MACD, try and figure this out here. So let's see if we can identify a flat area on the MACD. So I'm going to go point. 0, 02 ticks and 
actually. I think so. Here's another thing with when you're using the the max and min slope on indicators that run on their own sub panel, right? So these indicators don't run in tick sizes, right? So a tick measurement applies to the price panel, right? Applies to price. So when indicators run on their sub panel, they don't move in tick increments. They actually move in point increments. So let's change our measurement from ticks to points, like so. And oh, point zero two. And we can see basically that the whole thing, the whole MACD is considered flat when I change it to points. So let's um, go to something like that, point zero one. Still, wow, so we're really only identifying extreme moves in the MACD. So let's, uh, let's add another zero in there. And there we go. So now we found some kind of flat areas on the MACD, right? So if we look at the scaling on the MACD here, we're moving in like 0 0.0, well, I should say the values of the MACD, right? We're going anywhere from 0 0.02 down to 0 0.08. But each little bar to bar movement is actually very, very small. So we're like looking at 0 0.001 point movements. Here, let me... Uh, I'll knock this up to 2, 0.002. There we go. So now we can identify some more, a broader area of the MACD being flat, like so. All right, so when you're looking at, when you're trying to find a starting point for your, your slope settings here, you know, just kind of look at the scaling of your indicator, and that'll help you figure that out, right? So something like the CCI, right? The CCI goes from 0 to 200 and from 0 to negative 200. So if you're using the CCI, you're probably going to want some really big numbers in here. You know, you probably might want numbers like 2, you know, so 2 points, something like that. So... there. All right, I'll leave this solver like that. So it's looking for, or it's going to cut out flat areas. So I just put in there no flat, uh, for no flat areas on the MACD. All right, yeah, Frank, I'll show you that. So Frank is asking, how can you tell if price, and I'll just use the closing price, is close to the 10 EMA of the 30 SMA. All right, so it looks like that's the only question I got here. So yeah, let me show you how to do that there, Frank. Um, and um, all right, so here's another little tip. Another tip when you're running strategies in general, it doesn't matter if it's Raven or someone else's strategy that you might have bought, but if you're running a strategy in general, um, you know, and you need to kind of uh, and you need to turn off your strategy. So, so in this example, if you need to turn off Raven, what I would suggest, my little ninja tip, is bring up your control center, and right, so we can see, oops, uh, strategy. Let me open up the strategy, so we can see we have a strategy that's turned on here, right, Raven on the chart. So, if, if we need to disengage Raven. I would suggest that you use this flatten everything. So Ninja Trader has this flatten everything. And it will flatten everything. So it will also flatten any kind of discretionary manual trade that you might have taken on some other chart. 
But um, if all I have is Raven going, just hit flatten everything. And it flattened that position and it turned Raven off for me. So it's a nice way of making sure that Ninja Trader cleans up your strategy. So in this case, Ninja Trader cleaned up what Raven was doing. So Ninja closed out Raven, canceled everything, flattened it, and turned the strategy off. So, um, all right. So let's see. Let me open up Bloodhound here. And we'll go to our logic tab. And I'll open a new logic. So. All right, so that's what we're going to build there. So let's put that on the chart first. Um, all right, so we want the 10 EMA of the 30 SMA. All right, so let's uh, go down here. And we'll put our 10 EMA on the chart. All right, so it's going to be red. And now let's input the, oops, sorry, that should be 10. There we go. All right, now we'll input, nest the 30 SMA into that. So let's go find our SMA. There's our SMA. Change that to the 30. All right, there's our nice smooth indicator. So let's open Bloodhound back up. All right, so let's see, we want to find if price is near it. Okay, so it's going to circle a couple of points here. So we want to find that point, and we want to find this point right there. All right, so to do that, so what we're doing is we're comparing the closing price to our indicator right we're doing some kind of comparison here and in this case we're doing a, a distance comparison you know kind of a measurement comparison so with the comparison we're going to use our comparison solver like so connect that up and so now the next step is to set up our two different pieces of data so the closing price is the first piece of data and our indicator is the second piece of data that we're comparing. So in this case, we're gonna put um, price in indicator A. So indicator A is gonna be our price. And we're just gonna leave it on the closing price. And you know what? I've got 60 days of data in my chart, so that's gonna really slow things down. So let's knock this back down to five days, like so. All right, let me get things open back up. All right, back to our solver. So indicator A is set to our closing price. Now indicator B, we're gonna set that to our indicator. So let's build that extra smooth SMA on our on our uh, in Bloodhound so let's grab the EMA first like so it's our EMA I'll set the period to 10 now let's go find our SMA so first thing I need to do is just you know select our EMA down here first make sure that's that has been selected at least once and then I'll go back to the selection window go down to our SMA there we go now you're just gonna select it don't double click only one click single click to select it and then use the nested input button here now we can see the SMA is fed into the EMA and let's change our SMA to the 30 period right so in the 30 period SMA being fed 
or nested into our 10 period EMA, just like so. Right, so there we go. We can see our, our modified uh, indicator in here. And so now the next decision is, you know, how close does price need to be to our indicator? How close? So let's just say, let's see, we're on oil. So let's say, I don't know, five ticks. I'll just go for something kind of big here, five ticks. All right. Now the next thing we want to do is uh, we're going to use this A equals B um, output setting, right? So the long output and the short output have this A equals B. So I'm going to turn everything off. And then go back in and turn on the A equals B, right? So A equals B. And then right here, in the short output, we have A equals B, like so. And there we go. There's all of our points identified, like so. So. Right, so I set the long output and the short output, I set them, I turned them both on because Typically, you know, when price is close to something, um, that's, once again, that's kind of a non-directional kind of condition. That's a non-directional state. You know, just because price is close to an indicator, or you could say an, an indicator, if an indicator is close to an indicator, right? I mean, we could also say, you know, is our, is our, uh, what is this, our SMA, uh, well, let's see, what is this again? All right, yeah, our SMA 14. You know, we could check to see if our SMA 14 gets close, you know, to this smooth SMA, to this other red indicator. You know, we could see if those two get close to each other. And once again, that's kind of a non-directional statement. So that's why you typically will want a long and a short output at the same time. And then you'll use other other solvers, other conditions to determine if you want that to actually be a part of a long signal or a short signal, right? So, but that's how you would do something like that. All right, so um, looks like that wraps up for the questions. So with that, I'll say goodbye, guys. Have a great weekend, right?